So this particular set of chapters contains some of the, the most exciting stories that we get in the Book of Mormon where Nephi is being guided by the Lord and Lehi and, and the family as they go down through the wilderness to work their way out towards the seashore where they're going to then build the boat. In chapter 16, you'll notice we have finished up his conversation in chapter 15 with his brothers, uh, Laman and Lemuel, and notice verse 1 of chapter 16. It came to pass that after I, Nephi, had made an end of speaking to my brethren, behold, they said unto me, Thou hast declared unto us hard things more than we are able to bear. This is interesting because you can look at this idea of you've given us hard things. We can't, we can't bear them. The question is, is that a reflection of the things that Nephi taught or is it a reflection of, our, of the condition of our heart? If your heart is hard, then it doesn't matter what the prophets of God say or speak. It's going to feel uh, difficult. It's going to feel harsh. And, and he points that out in verse 2. It came to pass that I said unto them that I knew that I had spoken hard things against the wicked according to the truth. And the righteous have I justified and testified that they should be lifted up at the last day. Wherefore, the guilty taketh the truth to be hard, for it cutteth them to the very center. If you struggle with listening to the words of our church leaders, the, the knee-jerk response for the natural man and the natural woman inside of us is to, to point fingers at the leaders and say, you shouldn't say such harsh things. Whereas Nephi is inviting us to go and take a look in the mirror and say, let me analyze my heart, the condition of the hardness of my heart regarding these teachings and ask the question first from the New Testament, Lord, is it I that needs to make some adjustments? Because again, the natural man wants other people to make the adjustments, to soften things up, but the Lord wants us to first look at the inner vessel and soften the heart and then move forward on the, the covenant path. Now notice verse 4, it came to pass that I, Nephi, did exhort my brethren with all diligence to keep the commandments of the Lord, and it came to pass that they did humble themselves before the Lord. So here's Nephi thinking, hey, we're, we're good, they've, they've humbled themselves, we can now progress. Have you noticed? as we go through these stories, that there is this interesting phenomenon. What's the difference between a thermometer and a thermostat? With some buttons here to control temperature. What's the difference? Thermo stat. You'll notice that a thermometer is an object that can only be acted upon by the environment around it. If it's, if it's hot, then the thermometer raises. And if it's cold, then the thermometer goes down. But the thermometer doesn't control the environment. It is controlled by the environment. A thermostat registers what the temperature is and then acts. It makes adjustments. So it's the difference between an agent and an object waiting to be acted upon. Elder David A. Bednar has spoken at length about the contrast between agents and objects to be acted upon. You'll notice with Laman and Lemuel, the approach that they seem to be taking to life is more like a thermo or thermometer. If they're well fed, if everything's happy, if everybody's, uh, if plans are going forward, as they had hoped, then they're happy. We're good. But when it gets rough, then they get upset. 
and you're seeing that happen here yet again. So in this case, they've now humbled themselves. We're good, we move forward, but that's all going to change very shortly. It's, it's only going to take them uh, till about verse 22 before they're going to harden their hearts again. So this humility from verse 5 isn't going to last very long. Look at verse 7. It came to pass that I, Nephi, took one of the daughters of Ishmael to wife, and also my brethren took of the daughters of Ishmael to wife, and also Zoram took the eldest daughter of Ishmael to wife. So, this long uh, list of people who got married in verse 7. Look at verse 8. What's the very next thing that he, he mentions? Thus my father had fulfilled all the commandments of the Lord which had been given unto him, and also I, Nephi, had been blessed of the Lord exceedingly. I don't think it's chance that Nephi mentions entering into the marriage covenant and then the very next thing he mentions is being blessed of the Lord exceedingly. There's, there's a connection there. It, it is a beautiful thing when people are given that opportunity to enter into that new and everlasting covenant of the priesthood which, which binds us together as, as families. Now, we're ready to continue our journey into the wilderness. Verse 10, came to pass that as my father arose in the morning, he went forth to the tent door. To his great astonishment, he beheld upon the ground a round ball of curious workmanship. It was of fine brass. Within the ball were two spindles. The one pointed the way whether we should go into the wilderness. You'll notice that the word liahona, or the name for this ball, it doesn't appear anywhere in First or Second Nephi, nor Jacob for that matter. You don't get the name until clear down the road in Alma 37, one time in the Book of Mormon where, where it's given its name, liahona. Here in First Nephi, it's always called the, the director or the compass the ball of curious workmanship, and it, he describes that it would have new writing that would appear from time to time on, on the Liahona. And it, verse 16, it would lead them in the more fertile parts of the wilderness. So, think about this. You have a ball, it's got two spindles, and he just tells you that the one spindle points the direction we should go in the wilderness. He doesn't tell you about the other one, and there are a lot of theories out there about what that other spindle does. Some would say, well, it's a compass because they call it a compass in, in many places here, so it's probably just pointing north to orient and then the other pointing the direction. And there are lots of other ideas out there. Um, if it were important for our understanding, I think Nephi would have clarified. The key is there's one that points where we should go, and there are these new writings that will appear from time to time on the ball. I wonder what we have today that could be considered Liahona-like. The, something that points the way we should go to stay in the more fertile parts of the, the wilderness wandering that we're going through in mortality, and a writing that can change from time to time to give us specific instructions. I wonder if the scriptures I wonder if the words of living prophets, I wonder if the words of, of loved ones, trusted people in our life, I wonder if your patriarchal blessing could fit into this category of being a Liahona-like guide, giving direction to your life as you move forward through the uncertain uh, parts of your wilderness. So, they now travel in this south, southeast direction, verse 13, and they're, they're slaying food along the way. And then we get to the famous story, verse 18. It came to pass that as I, Nephi, went forth to slay food, behold, I did break my bow. I need to point something out that I learned uh, from a student in a, in a class that I was teaching who also happens to be a, a dear family friend. Uh, Sean Morgan pointed this little insight out to me. Look at the wording. I did break my bow. Brothers and sisters, if I were writing this story and I wanted to look good to the world, 
I would not have used what we call in English grammar the active voice. I would have used the passive voice, which would come out something like, it came to pass that as we did go forth to slay food, behold, my bow did break. I would put it in the passive. My bow got broken or something like that. But you'll notice what Nephi did. I did break my bow. He's taking ownership for it. He's not a victim of the circumstance. He's not an object waiting to be acted upon. He's an agent who has power to act, and he's saying that he did something that caused his bow to break. We don't know exactly what that is, but he's taking ownership. He's taking responsibility for the problem. I love this. Notice that his brethren in the second half of verse 18 were angry with him because of the loss of his bow, for we did obtain no food. And down in verse 21, it tells us that the brethren or his brother's bows had lost their springs. I, I'm not an expert in bows and arrows, but I've heard a lot of people who are talk about this, that the way you lose the spring is if you leave it strung too long. You don't unstring the bow and let it go back straight. Then it becomes weak and you can't, you can't fire arrows. Or if it's just old, it can also lose its spring. Do any of you find anything ironic here? that Nephi is the fourth young or the fourth oldest son. So you've got Laman, Lemuel, Sam, then Nephi. Nephi broke his fine, exceedingly fine steel bow. The older brothers' bows have all lost their spring and they're mad at him and they're murmuring at him because now they did obtain no food. Huh. If you put that in a real world setting, that means that for the last little while, we don't know how long that is, days, weeks, months, a year, we don't know, they've been relying exclusively on Nephi and his exceedingly fine steel bow to provide for the needs of the whole family. And now that his bow has lost, or now that his bow is, is broken, they're all hungry and they can't do anything about getting food because their bows have lost their spring. And so what is the solution? Verse 20, it came to pass that Laman and Lemuel and the sons of Ishmael did begin to murmur exceedingly because of their sufferings and afflictions in the wilderness. And also my father began to murmur against the Lord his God. Yea, and they were all exceedingly sorrowful, even that they did murmur against the Lord. Can you picture this? Sitting around camp, they're all hungry. It's, it's worse than the, the longest fast Sunday when you were growing up as a kid, if you can remember what that felt like. And they're sitting around and now they start into murmuring. And according to this, Father Lehi murmurs against the Lord his God. You brought us out here into the wilderness to perish, to die. We've got the plates, we've got the people, we, my sons are all married now, and now we're going to perish because we can't get food. And you'll notice how much of a meal murmuring provides. It doesn't change anything. It's just a reaction. It's not an action. It's the, like a thermometer. It's sitting down and complaining about what the environment is like right now. And right now we're hungry because we don't have food. So, notice the solution. Nephi went and he made a bow, a new bow in verse 23, and a straight stick provided an arrow for him. And people who are into archery will explain that you can't use steel or metal arrows with a, a new stick bow. I'm not an expert in this, but it's kind of cool that he makes the new wooden bow and a stick with one as one arrow. And then he gets a sling and some stones, and then he goes to his father, whither shall I go to obtain food? 
Do you notice how easy it would have been for Nephi to just quietly sneak out of camp and go and pray and then go find food? But he didn't do that. He went to his struggling father and he asked him, Dad, where, where should I go to obtain food? It's not much. My stones and my sling and my, my new wooden bow and wooden arrow, it's nothing compared to what I used to have. But it's something. It's all I've got. Now, ask the Lord to, to guide me. Isn't that amazing? To go to loved ones and invite and encourage them to turn to God in order to, to help the whole group in the process. Lehi asks the Lord, and the voice of the Lord came to him, and verse 27, he feared and trembled exceedingly, and also my brethren and the sons of Ishmael and our wives. Verse 28 describes, it came to pass that I, Nephi, beheld the pointers which were in the ball, that they did work according to the faith and diligence and heed which we did give unto them. You can have the best scriptures, the most inspired seers and revelators speaking to you and giving you all kinds of direction. But if we, as people, don't have faith in God and give diligent heed to those things that are coming, then it, it does no good. There, it's wasted. And he describes the new writing in verse 29. Once again, you have to have faith and diligence. Brothers and sisters, as you go through your life, rather than looking for the big, fantastical, heavenly visions and angelic ministrations and heavenly choirs singing to you, what difference would it make if we collectively and individually treated the, the scriptures and general conference and your patriarchal blessing and other inspired blessings and, and ministering efforts that, that come our way, what if we put more faith, diligence, and heed in those things? Notice the second half of verse 29. It was written and changed from time to time according to the faith and diligence which we gave unto it, and thus we see that by small means the Lord can bring about great things. I love that. That gives me hope that it's these small things that can lead to, to great changes. And by the way, Alma the Younger is going to pick up on that theme of small leading to great when he's talking to his son Helaman in Alma 37, when he's recounting this story and giving the name of the Liahona. And it's also in that chapter where he tells his son, you know what? The distance that, that Lehi's family had to travel and Ishmael's group, it was so short they should have been able to do it very quickly, but it took them eight years. And Alma's going to tell his son, the reason it took them eight years is because they went in a circuitous route. They, they took a lot of sidetracks. They went directions they shouldn't have gone because they didn't give sufficient faith, diligence, and heed to what God had given them and was willing to give them on the Liahona. I think that applies to us sometimes. Is it possible that some of the struggles and the trials and the tribulations that come into our life aren't because God's up in heaven saying, I want this to be as long and drawn out and painful as possible for you, but because we don't give the kind of diligent heed and faith in God through his prophets and his leaders and the scriptures as would otherwise have protected us from some of these circuitous parts of a wilderness wandering that we're going to see happen here with this family, with these families. You'll notice he went uh, in verse 30 to the top of the mountain and he slew some wild beasts. Came back into the camp and what happens? In a thermometer perspective, we were starving hungry, but now there's food, so we rejoice. You, you see this pattern over and over again. We're all happy, right? Well, just wait, watch, read on. Verse 34, it came to pass that Ishmael died and was buried which, in, in a place which was called Nahom. So we were, we were happy, we're fed, we move on, but now our father-in-law 
Ishmael dies and we bury him. Very interesting to look at the name of the place where they bury him, Nahum. So names in the Book of Mormon are often very significant. They teach us lessons that when we understand the meanings of the words can help push along the narrative and the purposes of the Book of Mormon. So let's write this out here, the word Nahom. In Semitic languages, what matters is actually the consonants of the word. And depending on the vowels you put in there, it can change uh, the meaning of the word. I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, the Hebrew word for king is melech, and so the core root words, MLK, if you put it like this, mulek, it might mean something like a prince or a little king. Or if you say um, mamleka, I may have misspelled that, it actually means like a, a kingdom, but there's different ways you take the core root word and provide new meaning. So. The word Nahom, if we look in Semitic languages like Hebrew or Arabic or South Arabian, Nahom actually means something like uh, sorrow or consolation, which is very interesting because this is how they felt. They felt sorrowful that Ishmael had died. But let's look closely and notice that it says, he was buried, this is verse 34, buried in the place which was called Nahum. Now, it doesn't appear that Lehi's party named the place Nahum. Let's go back and look at verse 13 in the same chapter. Near the end of the verse, it says, they did pinch, we did pitch our tents again, and we did call the name of the place Shazer. Which, by the way, Shazer probably means something like gazelle, which is exactly what you'd be looking for to eat. And you find out that they actually go out hunting in verse 14 and are very prosperous in finding gazelles. Well, it doesn't say gazelles. They find food to eat, and it, it may have been gazelles, which live in the area where um, they, were, they were hunting. But notice again, it says, the name of the place, we did call the name of the place Shazer. The difference here is in the Book of Mormon, Nahom apparently was already named when Lehi's party arrived. It was not given by Lehi's party, that name. And sure enough, it turns out at the time of Lehi, there was a location in the Saudi Arabian Peninsula named Nahom or Nechem. And actually it was uh, also in that location, there was a, a tribe of people called the Nehemites, and the largest ancient burial ground in, Saudi Arabia, in ancient Saudi Arabia, the ancient Arabian Peninsula, is right there in that location, in Nahum, or Nahom. So it's fascinating. If we want to take the Book of Mormon seriously, we now have strong encouragement that Nahom was a real location that had already been named by other people when Lehi's party arrived, and we can now put it on a map, as you can see here in the depictions. But whatever it may be, What's important here to note is that Nephi is telling this story to show God's power and goodness, even in the face of death. Remember back to 1 Nephi chapter 1, verse 20, that God will deliver the faithful. And these stories here are all evidence for how God does deliver the faithful, even in their sorrow, even in a place of Nahum, where you feel the loss of someone that you care deeply about. So you'll notice what Taylor's talking about. Often when you get introduced to a brand new word in the Book of Mormon, either right before or right after, they'll give you some part of the definition. Look at verse 35, and it came to pass that the daughters of Ishmael did mourn exceedingly uh, because of the loss of their father and because of their afflictions in the wilderness. And they did murmur against my father because he had brought them out of the land of Jerusalem, saying, Our father is dead, yea, and we have wandered much in the wilderness. We have suffered much affliction, hunger, thirst, and fatigue. And after all these sufferings, we must perish in the wilderness with hunger. So they want to return again to Jerusalem. They want to go back. They want to go home. They're done. They don't want to keep moving forward. Uh, sounds like some trials in mortality that 
that certain people pass through where it just gets hard to the point where they say, I don't want, I, I, I can't keep going forward. Now you'll notice Laman and Lemuel's response. Verse 37, Laman said unto Lemuel and also unto the sons of Ishmael, Behold, let us slay our father and also our brother Nephi, who has taken it upon him to be our ruler and our teacher, who are his elder brethren. And they, they accuse him of, of deceiving their eyes by his, by his powerful arts with the Liahona and other things, all with the intent to try to take the ruling of the people. Now, are you noticing what's happening here? We lost our father-in-law, if you're Laman and Lemuel, and we feel so bad in this object waiting to be acted upon mentality, we feel so down that the, the, the solution we've come up with to feel better about life is let's kill our own dad and our brother so that we don't have to worry about having to listen to them anymore and somehow that's going to make us feel better? This is, a, this is an interesting, interesting solution to the problem of mourning and grief and sorrow. Oh, and by the way, don't forget the fact that Nephi's wife also lost her father that day. Uh, it's not just the rest of the family who's in mourning. And so now, verse 39, it came to pass that the Lord was with us, yea, even the voice of the Lord came and did speak many words unto them and did chasten them exceedingly. And after they were chastened by the voice of the Lord, they did turn away their anger and re did repent of their sins. Up and down, up and down. You're seeing this, this approach to life that, quite frankly, feels like a roller coaster. When, when you choose to, to take the therm thermometer approach to life. Now, go to chapter 17, verse 4, that they did sojourn for the space of many years, even eight years in the wilderness. We mentioned it already. You could cross-reference that with Alma, chapter 37 verse 41 through 47, where Alma the Younger is going to explain that it didn't need to take that long. It, it didn't have to be that hard, but it was. Let's also connect this to the ancient Israelites, the ancestors of Lehi's party, that we are also part of the house of Israel. God took them out of Egyptian bondage and they wandered for 40 years in the wilderness. Now, it turns out you could actually hike from Egypt up into the Holy Land in probably the course of, I don't know, maybe a couple of weeks or a month. But 40 years, man, you have to be going really slow. And think about when you're ever on a family trip and your kids are saying, are we there yet? That's how the Israelites were with God. And God's like, listen, there's a plan going on here. And if you just would be a little bit humble and patient, you could learn some important things. So when you read this part of the Book of Mormon, Nephi is recounting his story with echoes and remembrances to the wandering of the Israelites, including murmurings and chastenings. We've seen all that going on. And what Nephi wants us to understand is that God is true and faithful. And for the people who are humble and put their faith totally and fully in God, they will be delivered. Now, all of us may be wandering for some time in our own personal wildernesses, and there is definitely a lot to learn on the journey. But we might ask ourselves, do we enjoy being sidelined on the journey just because we would rather be acted upon and get angry about stuff instead of acting for ourselves as God has instructed us to do? So again, as you read these parts, look for the commonalities, both with the story of the Israelites, as well as your own life and say, what could I do today to be more faithful and trusting in God so my sojourn doesn't take eight years? Okay, now we get two new words. Verse 5, we did come to the land which we called Bountiful. Why did they name it Bountiful? Because of its much fruit and also wild honey. Second half of the verse, and we beheld the sea which we called Eriantum, which being interpreted is many waters. So he gives you these new names and then tells you what they mean, bountiful and irrigantum. Then verse 7, something very peculiar happens. For the first time in our story, in these first 17 chapters, the voice of the Lord came to Nephi saying, arise, get thee into the mountain. 
And it came to pass that I arose and went up into the mountain and cried unto the Lord. And it's here where God commands Nephi to build a ship. Now, why is this unique? Because every previous revelation that gives direction for the group, the next set of instructions for what they need to do, every time previous to chapter 17, those directions have been given through Father Lehi. Now, for the first time, it comes to Nephi. I don't know if this is the case or not, but back in chapter 16, when Father Lehi was murmuring against the Lord, it told us that when he read the writing on the Liahona, he did tremble and fear exceedingly. God was rebuking him. It makes me wonder if, similar to Moses and the children of Israel out in the wilderness, when Moses kind of complained against the Lord, God had to teach even his great prophet Moses some lessons of, of submission and trusting in him, even when things seem to be uh, all falling apart. I wonder, I wonder what effect it had when Nephi comes down off of the mountain, comes into the, the camp and says to his father, Dad, I got a revelation from the Lord up on the mountain. He wants us to build a ship. I wonder if that's God now working with Father Lehi even further through this process, this refining process of mortality that even the prophets aren't above uh, the need to receive that, that refining influence from God. The reason I like this is because the next revelation that's going to come, which is get all of the people and get on the ship now, who is it that receives that revelation in, in a few chapters? That's Lehi again. Lehi starts getting those directions again. So it gives me hope that uh, what the Lord teaches in the Doctrine and Covenant section 121 about reproving betimes with sharpness, but then showing an increase of love thereafter, that I think God does that. He models that perfectly with us when dealing with us. And sometimes there is some discipline that needs to be applied appropriately with, with sharpness and then afterwards show an increase of love. So that's a possible way to, to see what's going on here. So Nephi comes down off the mountain and verse 15, wherefore I, Nephi, did strive to keep the commandments of the Lord, and I did exhort my brethren to faithfulness and diligence. Can you picture Laman and Lemuel watching Nephi start to, to build tools and get things ready to build a ship? This is not Nephi the shipbuilder. He's never done anything like this before. And you can picture the mocking. Verse 17, when my brethren saw that I was about to build a ship, they began to murmur against me, saying, Our brother is a fool, for he thinketh he can build a ship, yea, and he also thinketh that he can cross these great waters. Once again, thermometer. You, you look at the environment, you look at the things around you, and then you, you react. You, you don't act, you just react. And that to them is silly. Are you kidding? You think you can build a ship and cross these waters? Well, it's going to be another chapter and a half, and we're going to have a finished, completed ship ready to launch. And yet, that isn't going to change their heart. It's not going to build their discipleship. Brothers and sisters, signs and proofs don't build lasting discipleship. And, and we see this over and over. They've seen an angel, they've heard the voice of God, they've been shocked, they've had miracle after miracle after miracle, and yet the farther into the journey we get, it seems that the harder and more, more difficult to, uh, to work with they become. Look at verse 18. Nephi gives you his reason for why he thinks they're doing this. Thus my brethren did complain against me and were desirous that they might not labor. He basically just said that they're lazy. They would rather just live in bountiful because of, because of its much, much fruit and honey and all of these, these wonderful things to live on. They've got oceanfront property. Let's just stay here. 
Let's not try to build a ship. So Nephi spends all this time working with them. Look at verse 21. Here's their response. Behold, these many years we have suffered in the wilderness, which time we might have enjoyed our possessions in the land of our inheritance, yea, and we might have been happy. Brothers and sisters, this is a, this is a really powerful concept that they're saying we might have been happy, as if happiness is this thing that's out here in the environment around me, and if I'm in the right place at the right time, then I can be, I might be happy because now I can absorb it. It's this external thing that comes to me. I love the gospel of Jesus Christ, this, this shift of thinking from a reactionary thermometer to an action-oriented or an agent-oriented thermostat, this idea that, that you act. You don't wait for happiness to hit you. You don't wait to be happy. You find and you create happiness. You spread happiness. This same concept can be used for every good attribute of God or, or aspect of the gospel. For instance, love. You can wait to feel love. You can wait for the environment around you filled with people and things to love you and to accept you. Or you can take the action-oriented perspective and say, I'm not going to wait to be loved, I'm going to love. It's the difference between a noun and a verb. I'm going to act in faith. I'm going to love others whether or not they love me. And in the process, you're going to feel love in your soul. Uh, faith, same thing. As Elder Neil L. Anderson once said, faith is not by chance but by choice. So we can sit around and wait for happiness or faith or love or hope or meekness or fill in the blank with whatever attribute you would like. You can wait for those things to come to us from our environment. You can wait to, to be immersed in them or you can make a choice to act in those areas, in those attributes, to exercise those attributes, especially when it, it is a wilderness time because that's where you have the greatest potential for growth moving forward. So, if you were to take Laman and Lemuel and put them back in Jerusalem in the lands of their possessions with all of the, the inheritance, they might have been happy. That is a true statement, but it wouldn't have lasted. It would be a matter of time before something would go wrong and they would become upset and begin to murmur. So, notice they, they then bear their testimony to Nephi, verse 22, we know that the people who were in the land of Jerusalem were a righteous people, for they kept the statutes and judgments of the Lord and all his commandments according to the law of Moses. So their interpretation of the law of Moses is, hey, the people in Jerusalem, Father Lehi was preaching against them and so was Jeremiah and we've got other Old Testament prophets that are contemporary here, Ezekiel and Daniel to mention a few, and we think that the people in Jerusalem are actually keeping the law of Moses. Nephi then bears testimony for them, which is interesting, verse 25 through 29, ye know, just, just notice in verse 25 through 29 how many times he says, ye know, ye know, ye also know. And then he spends the rest of the chapter trying to shore up their faith, the assurance level of their faith. Elder David A. Bednar gave an incredible talk years ago called Seek Learning by Faith, where he talked about three aspects of faith. You have the assurance level of faith which is where you look to the past, where you believe that, that God 
is going to do what he says he's going to do, which then leads to the action level of faith, which to me is the present, which then leads to the evidence level of faith, which is in the future, after you act. You'll notice Laman and Lemuel, they're not helping to build the ship because they don't believe that Nephi can do it. They don't believe that God commanded him. They think he's crazy. So he spends the rest of chapter 17 trying to shore up the assurance level of their faith so that they will then work and help him build the ship. Uh, if you or a loved one is struggling to keep the commandments or struggling to move forward in faith, a nice pattern is to pause for a minute, look to the past, and look for God's hand. Look for God's power. Look for God's knowledge and his wisdom and his, his tender mercies. And once the assurance level of faith gets to that certain point, then it makes it so that we can move forward and act in faith. So it's really powerful that Nephi uses the evidence of the Israelite past to provide assurance to his brothers that God can once again, as they act, deliver them. Now notice a couple of really important things here. If we take a look at verse 40 in chapter 17, and he, talking about Jehovah, God, loveth those who will have him to be their God. This is covenantal language. The word love, among many meanings, in covenantal language means loyalty. So God is covenantally bound. He loveth those who will have him to be their God. Imagine a marriage relationship. Behold, he loved our fathers. He was in covenant with them. Yea, even Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he remembered the covenants which he had made, wherefore he did bring them out of the land of Egypt. Pause there for a moment. The Israelites did not on their own deserve to be saved from Egyptian bondage. God was covenantally obligated to save them out of Egyptian bondage. And so all the mighty acts of salvation we have in the book of Exodus, which are the evidences that Nephi is talking about, were done because of God's covenantal commitment to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and their descendants. Therefore, the undercurrent of what Nephi is saying is, we're all children of Abraham. God has covenanted to our fathers, and that covenant is live and well with us, that God is covenantally and duty-bound to provide salvation for us. And we just have to believe and act on that. We have to choose, and he will give us evidence. There's plenty of evidence already. And what we encourage you to look for as you read the scriptures is that the Book of Mormon is evidence for us today that God can assure us in our faith that we can act and also experience the salvation that he promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and all their descendants, which includes all of us. And God will never break that covenant. But let me just share one other interesting insight that we have going on here. This is a fact about Nephi that most of us never talk about. And it's the fact that Nephi is literate. He knows how to write. In the ancient world, very few people know, knew how to write. Estimates are anywhere from maybe five or 10%. Most people were farmers. You didn't need to know how to write to go plant. But Nephi knows how to write. And how would have he been trained to write? Well, probably growing up in a wealthy family and being the fourth son who's not gonna inherit the family business, it, apparently, Lehi sent him to scribal school. And it's interesting, in scribal school, the students were trained, likely, in what's called the wisdom tradition. So they were trained in the difference between being a wise person and a fool. And if you're interested in understanding some of the core principles that may have animated Nephi's life, look up in the wisdom tradition in the Bible, in Proverbs, Chapters 1 through 9. You can actually read all of Proverbs. But if you just did a quick read of Proverbs 1 through 9 and kind of look for like main ideas and go back and read Nephi. And what you will discover is that Nephi seems to have been trained in the wisdom tradition and been trained to be a wise person. And the main idea is, is a wise person listens to God, listens to parents, and records the truth, preserves them, and teaches them to others. Now notice what Laman and Lemuel say about their brother. They call him a fool. 
And it's very interesting, when they try to kill him, what happens? Verse 48, touch me not, I am filled with the power of God. And he uses this interesting phrase, whoso shall lay his hands upon me shall wither even as a dried reed. It turns out in the ancient wisdom tra tradition in that literature, one of the core poetic concepts of death was a dried reed. In fact, think about Nephi. If he's trained as a writer, he may have been trained to use dry reeds to inscribe on tablets, clay tablets, before he moved to metal. So it's just fascinating here, all these interesting connections that we have about Nephi and his training, his ability to write, his ability to be a wise person. But why does this matter to us? We all want to be wise people. And the wisest people trust God. The wisest people look at the evidences God has already provided and therefore have assurance that they too can act and have personal evidence. So in your own life, return to the scriptures, return to the story of the Exodus, return to the Book of Mormon and see these as evidences that God will fulfill his covenant to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And therefore, you can be assured that your faith is founded on a strong foundation and you will become wise and avoid being a fool. Now, we begin the work. So he's shored up their assurance, now they're willing to act. And they are acting in faith in this regard. They're, they're going to, to help him. Verse 1, chapter 18, it came to pass that they did worship the Lord and did go forth with me, and we did work timbers of curious workmanship. And the Lord did show me from time to time after what manner I should work the timbers of the ship. Something that I learned from a friend and colleague, Benjamin White, is this idea that God is asking them to build a ship, something they've never done before. They've never uh, lived on the, the seashore and been a part of the shipbuilding guild of their day, but now God's asking them to do it. The question is, what are some ships that God is asking you and us collectively to build today? Perhaps things that we've never built before. This is a fascinating word in English because there are so many words that end with ship. Let me just give you some examples. Some of you are being asked to build a relationship that you've never built before, and it's hard, and you don't know what you're doing, and you feel like it's, it takes a lot of work. Some of you are being asked to build membership. Some are working on fellowship, or scholarship, or friendship, or hardship, or leadership, or companionship, or sportsmanship. At the end of the day, all of these ships that need to be built for me come down to two words. The most important ships involve worship of the Lord and discipleship. of Christ. So, what do we do? Where do we turn in, in all of these ships that we're being asked to build? He gives you some ideas in verse 2. Now, I, Nephi did not work the timbers after the manner which was learned by men. Neither did I build the ship after the manner of men, but I did build it after the manner which the Lord had shown unto me, wherefore it was not after the manner of men. You can look at all the ships that you're being asked to build, and there is the learning of, of mankind, the manner of men, or you can turn to the Lord to ask him how to build these particular ships. Verse 3, I, Nephi, did go into the mount oft, circle it, it's oft. He didn't just go up at the beginning and God give him a big stack of blueprints and say, good luck, go, go put this together. 
he went up oft, and I did pray oft unto the Lord, wherefore the Lord showed unto me great things. This implies a long, drawn-out process, not a short or simple event. Kind of like discipleship, kind of like worship, a long, drawn-out process of life rather than a quick event, a thrill, a rush, uh, some carnal enjoyment, which is all uh, summarized in what Satan offers us. That's what all these temptations are for a fleeting moment, an event. After they finished the ship, it was exceedingly fine, verse 4, wherefore they did humble themselves again before the Lord. They're in awe at what they've, they've been able to be a part of building, and it's amazing. So, verse 5, the word of the Lord came unto my father. I like that. It didn't come to Nephi in this case. It came back to Father Lehi. Take the family, go down, get in the ship. So they prepared everything, they went into the ship, and along the way we get out into the, to the ocean. Verse 9 says, After we had been driven forth before the wind for the space of many days, behold, my brethren and the sons of Ishmael and also their wives began to make themselves merry, insomuch that they began to dance and to sing and to speak with much rudeness, yea, even that they did forget by what power they had been brought thither yea, they were lifted up into exceeding rudeness." So Nephi speaks to them with soberness. They don't like being told what to do by Nephi. They've made that very clear. They will not have him be a ruler over them. They're, they're very interested in who's in charge, and they, the older brothers, are going to be in charge, and they're making that very known. So they tie up Nephi, and the compass, verse 12, ceased to work. So they have no idea where to steer the ship. And then the storm comes, and it lasts for three days. They're driven back, and on the fourth day, the tempest began to be exceedingly sore. They realized we're about to sink, so they finally come and loose the bands in verse 15, and his wrists and his ankles are exceedingly swollen, and after describing his, his soreness, look at the very next word, verse 16, nevertheless. Minimize what just came before and put always the greater or nevertheless emphasis on what's about to come next. I did look unto my God. Brothers and sisters, this is such a simple thing, but if we're not careful, it's easy to look at the soreness and the swollen wrists and ankles of life and murmur and complain about the injustices and the, the struggles and the tribulations and trials that we're asked to, to pass through and how, why is God making this so much harder than it needs to be? Or we can simply recognize and acknowledge the fact that there is soreness but follow this example of, nevertheless, I did look unto my God. Isn't that fascinating? Instead of looking to Laman and Lemuel after they've untied him and saying, now let's fight. Let's, let's, I'm going to, I'm going to beat you up for what you did to me. Instead of looking at our problem, look up, look at the solution. Wasn't it uh, Elder Carl Cook in President Monson in the elevator who said, look up, look up. It's, it's a much better direction to, to look. And I did praise him all the day long, and I did not murmur against the Lord because of mine afflictions. So then it works. We get to the uh, promised land as their hearts are softened in verse 20, and we arrive in the promised land in verse 23, and verse 24 says, it came to pass that we did begin to till the earth, and we began to plant seeds. Yea, we did put all our seeds into the earth which we had brought from the land of Jerusalem. I want to point out one word. We did put all our seeds 
What does that imply? What's the lesson here? Most of us would be tempted to hold back some of the seeds in case this was a bad growing year. This is a new land, new soil, perhaps slightly modified climate from what you're used to, so perhaps hold back. I love the fact that this group put all of their seeds into the ground. That to me is, is a huge leap of faith to, to trust in God that he brought them to this promised land and that he's going to keep providing for them. So the first thing they do is they plant seeds. Now some of you have moved around a lot in your life and you'll notice when you move from place to place how easy it is to hold back and to not put the roots in deep or to plant all the seeds. I love this, this approach to life that he's teaching here which is put all of our effort into growing relationships and uh, friendships wherever we may be. Put all of the seeds in and grow and we're going to learn great things and gain great relationships in the process. And God caused that they should grow exceedingly and we were blessed in abundance. And then he describes all of the things in the land of promise. Now as you shift over to chapter 19, this is where Nephi pauses and tells us that he's making plates out of ore once he gets to the, to the promised land. Now let's be clear, when they first come is when he first seems to start making these plates in the Americas. It's not until 2 Nephi 5 where we're going to find out that it's 30 years after they left Jerusalem that he's given the command to make the small plates, which means for the first 30 years he's been working on this large collection of plates giving all kinds of detail and then from year 30 to approximately year 40, so probably about a 10 year period, he's now working on draft number two, which is what we get, the first and second Nephi accounts here. It's the second telling of the story. It's not his first draft, which means he's had time to organize thoughts and make connections that maybe he hadn't made the first time through. So we get the better version, in my opinion, with uh, the small plates. Now, why is he making the small plates? Look at the bottom of verse 3. The things which were written should be kept for the instruction of my people who should possess the land and also for other wise purposes which purposes are known unto the Lord. He, he doesn't know why, but he's gonna, going to trust in the Lord. Then uh, he shifts focus to talk about Jesus and the infinite atonement. Look at verse 8. Behold, he cometh according to the words of the angel in 600 years from the time my father left Jerusalem. Now keep in mind, we, we are very comfortable using the name Jesus. We learn in 2 Nephi 10 where Jacob's teaching the people, the name is revealed to him that the name of the Messiah is Jesus and it comes right after he had read to them a, a block of Isaiah chapters and then gave his interpretation. And then it's later on in 2 Nephi 25 when it's revealed to Nephi after a long Isaiah block that his full name and title would be Jesus Christ. Now, keep in mind this is his second copy and so he had used the name in the 1830 edition of the Book of Mormon. He used the name Jesus one time before this but it seems to have been a name that was revealed for the Messiah because previous to this he's just known as the Messiah, the anointed one in the Hebrew. And the world because of their iniquity shall judge him to be a thing of naught, wherefore they scourge him and he suffereth it, they smite him and he suffereth it, yea, they spit upon him and he suffereth it because of his loving kindness and his long suffering towards the children of men. I love that, that he, he has all of this power and yet he suffereth it. Why? Because of his, his loving kindness and long-suffering towards all of us. 
Then in verse 10, he describes how the God of Abraham and of Isaac and the God of Jacob yieldeth himself according to the words of the angel as a man into the hands of wicked men to be lifted up according to the words of Zenoch and to be crucified according to the words of Neum and to be buried in a sepulchre according to the words of Zenos. So you get Zenoch, Neum, and Zenos, three Old Testament prophets that aren't in the Old Testament, but they're on the brass plates. Nephi has access to them, but we just don't get their stories. But they get these prophecies of what would happen to him, what would happen to the Holy Messiah. Now towards the end, you'll notice it says in verse 22, it came to pass that I, Nephi, did teach my brethren these things, and it came to pass that I did read many things to them which were engraven upon the plates of brass that they might know concerning the doings of the Lord in other lands among the people of old. Have you noticed how in the Book of Mormon, Nephi is doing all of the reading off the plates of brass and all of the teaching. He's teaching his brothers. He's reading to his brothers. It never says they were reading and asked me what this meant. Now, there are a variety of options here. Either they did read and Nephi just didn't mention that they were reading scripture and asking questions. That's a possibility. Or they were able to read Reformed Egyptian or Egyptian script and understand it, but they just didn't want to read the brass plates. That's an option. Another option is they just never took the time to learn to read and write in Egyptian. That's also a possibility. What we know from Nephi's record is that he's the one who's always doing the reading and teaching. So as we talked about before, Nephi probably was trained in a scribal school. He was literate. And the scribal schools, the main principle was learn to be a wise person. And the opposite is a fool. If you look at the scriptures, if you look at how Nephi narrates, who's the wise? Well, it's God himself. Nephi aspires to be like him, as is Lehi. And then who are the counterexamples? Laman and Lemuel are the ultimate fools. And it's also interesting that they probably are illiterate. They probably never took the time to learn how to read the Word of God and to act in doctrine. So to jump way ahead to Jesus' Sermon at the Temple or his Sermon on the Mount, he gives us his qualifier between the wise man and the foolish man. Uh, an insight that I learned from my stake president and dear friend Clint Mortensen, he pointed this out, that the foolish men hears the word of God, but he doesn't act on it. He doesn't do anything about it. It's the wise man who hears and then does the things that he hears from God. So, this whole story of, of Nephi trying to follow the wisdom literature seems to match up beautifully because he's not just wanting to hear the word of the Lord, he's wanting to go and do the things which the Lord hath commanded. That's what a true wise person does. His famous statement to his father, I will go and do the things which the Lord hath commanded, that is the essence of wisdom in, in his day. Now notice verse 23, I did read many things unto them which were written in the books of Moses, but that I might more fully persuade them to believe in the Lord the Redeemer. I did read unto them that which was written by the prophet Isaiah, for I did liken all scriptures unto us that it might be for our profit and learning. Once again, that word all, I did liken all scriptures unto us, that it might be for our profit and learning. I love that principle. But did you notice what he did right before that? He was reading the books of Moses. We've been talking about that. Taylor's mentioned lots of things from the Exodus. They aren't getting it. So he cross-references Moses. He says, but that I might more fully persuade them to believe in the Lord their Redeemer, I did read unto them that which was written by the prophet Isaiah. Can you picture him reading off the brass plates and then looking at them saying, you're not getting the connection here, are you? And can you see in your mind's eye, Laman and Lemuel sitting there? Uh, no. you, you getting this, Lem? No, I'm not getting it. No, no, we don't get this. And Nephi's saying, okay, 
let me make it more obvious. Let me make it even clearer. Let's turn the brass plates over to the writings of Isaiah. Then it will be more clear what we're talking about. I love that, that Nephi is using Isaiah to help them more fully believe in the Lord, the Redeemer. And now he launches into chapter uh, 48 and 49 of Isaiah, which to us is our chapter 20 and 21. Chapter 48, you could label chapter 48 uh, Nephi's, or rather Isaiah's review of the Abrahamic covenant. This is, this is so beautiful where God is extending all of these incredible promises. Look at verse 1, hearken and hear this, O house of Jacob, who are called by the name of Israel, and are come forth out of the waters of Judah, or out of the waters of baptism. I need to just point out here very quickly, you can put a parenthesis around or out of the waters of baptism because that little parenthetical phrase was not in the original manuscript or in the 1830 edition. Joseph Smith added that parenthetical statement to the 1840 edition reprinting of the book and he had parentheses around it. And then in the 1921 edition, the scripture committee took the parentheses off. What does that mean? It means if you read Genesis, or sorry, if you read Isaiah chapter 48, you're not going to see the phrase or out of the waters of baptism. It's added. Why? Because Joseph is a prophet, seer, and revelator, and he has the authority, he has keys from heaven to clarify, expound, and teach doctrine and make it clear. So people were confused about what it meant to come out of the waters of Judah. So he added, or out of the waters of baptism. So even though it isn't unique to Isaiah and and original to Isaiah, it's Joseph, the prophet and seer of our Lord, saying this is what he meant. So it, it adds clarity. Now notice he goes on to say, who swear by the name of the Lord and make mention of the God of Israel, yet they swear not in truth nor in righteousness. He's describing people who have come into the gospel, so to speak, by name only. They, they've been baptized, but they aren't converted and they, aren't, they don't seem to be working towards conversion. Look at verse 2, they call themselves of the holy city, but they do not stay themselves upon the God of Israel, who is the Lord of hosts. So he goes on to explain, verse 4, I did it, I did some things to them because I knew that thou art obstinate and thy neck is an iron sinew and thy brow brass. So he's using these symbols to teach principles, an iron neck, a brass brow where all of the emotion is shown, it's brass. Uh, Doesn't that kind of describe an idol? A brass brow, an iron neck, it can't move, it can't show emotion, it can't communicate in any way, shape, or form. As people become idol worshipers, over time they slowly become like that which they are worshiping. Israel has slowly become more and more and more like idols. So then he goes on and he describes his mercy. Look at verse 9, nevertheless for my name's sake will I defer mine anger and for my praise will I refrain from thee that I cut thee not off. You deserve to be totally abolished, but because of this covenant that I've made with Abraham, I'm not going to cut you off completely. I'm going to remember that covenant. I'm going to deliver you. And he goes on to, to plead with them to hearken and verse 14, assemble yourselves and hear, fulfill the words. Verse 16, come ye near unto me. I haven't spoken in secret from the beginning, from the time that it was declared have I spoken, and the Lord God and his Spirit hath sent me. And he's pleading with Israel to return. Now, turn the page over. Chapter 21 is Nephi taking this Abrahamic covenant set up as the Lord saying, look, I'm I'm doing this for you because of the covenant that I've made, and then he's going to apply it to his people in chapter 21, which is the equivalent of Isaiah 49. He he describes all the things that God is going to do with this group. Look at, let's jump down for the sake of time to verse 13. Sing, O heavens, and be joyful, O earth. 
for the feet of those who are in the east shall be established and break forth into singing, O mountains, for they shall be smitten no more, for the Lord hath comforted his people and will have mercy upon his, his afflicted. Do you see it? He's going to have mercy on these people who have been cut off temporarily. He's going to, to remember them. Look at verse 15. Can a woman forget her sucking child? that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb. Can you see Isaiah using the most dependent relationship he can think of, which is a newborn baby and its mother, and he's using that to compare with our relationship with God. Can a woman forget that sucking child? And he says, yea, they may forget. There have been women in the history of the world who have done that. But I will not forget thee, O house of Israel. Why? Verse 16, Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. Thy walls are continually before me. And then he describes this glorious gathering event where Jerusalem or Zion or the house of Israel will be on the ground and sad and all of a sudden she'll look up and there are all these children coming to her, returning from this exile. They've been carried away captive and she's been left desolate. And she's going to have this question in verse 21. Then shalt thou say in thine heart, Who hath begotten me these? Seeing I have lost my children and am desolate, a captive, and removing to and fro. Who hath brought up these? Behold, I was left alone. These, where have they been? Thus saith the Lord God. Behold, I will lift up mine hand to the Gentiles and set up my standard to the people. And they shall bring thy sons in their arms, and thy daughters shall be carried upon their shoulders. Brothers and sisters, this is the great work of the latter-day gathering of Israel, where Gentiles and scattered Israel and Jews are being invited into this covenant relationship with God to be adopted into the house of Israel, to become sons and daughters of Abraham and Sarah. If they aren't literally, then adopted in to become a part of this family where God is going to remember that covenant and reach out and restore. And so he brings all of these people in and Israel says, I, I have no idea where these all came from. This is the story of what our missionaries, our church leaders, our mommies, our daddies, everybody is trying to do today is to invite people on both sides of the veil to come unto Christ, to get on that covenant path and press forward. Chapter 22 is Nephi's conclusion where he just read you two Isaiah chapters. Now he gives you his commentary as to what he feels like that means for him and his people and looking down the corridor of time hoping that in the future somebody will also be benefited by the words that he's writing for his own people in his day. In closing, brothers and sisters, we're all collectively and individually on this wilderness journey. God has provided means for us. We may not have a round ball of curious workmanship, but we have books and we have teachings of curious workmanship and they're not built after the manner of men. They're built after the manner of the Lord. And as we give faith, diligence, and heed unto these beautiful instruments and uh, messengers that God has provided, we will move forward in faith. We will accomplish things. That assurance level of our faith will allow us to act in greater faith than ever before and will lead to greater evidence than ever before as we move forward in this great gathering effort of the house of Israel in the latter days. Know that he lives. Know that he loves you. And we leave that with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. At Scripture Central, we are committed to building enduring faith in Jesus Christ by illuminating the Book of Mormon and other Restoration Scripture, making them more accessible, defensible, and comprehensible to people everywhere. One way we do this is by offering all of our world-class resources for free. We hope that by using these resources, you can take your study to the next level and unlock levels of understanding for your life. One of these tools is the Gospel Learning App, which takes you on a curated study path into the specific topics relating to this week's Come Follow Me content. This week in the Gospel Explorer, you can take the left path to learn more about godly sorrow and repentance. The middle pathway dives deep into a study of agency and responsibility. Lastly, 
you can take the path upon the right to study how you can better fulfill a difficult or challenging calling. These paths and resources are here to help you come closer to your Savior, Jesus Christ. As always, it is our hope that you deepen your conversion to Him as you study His words and immerse yourself in the Scriptures.